Yeah. Um, I'm going to call to order a meeting of the Strategic Planning Committee at 7.02 in um, City Hall Room 208. And if um, the clerk would call the roll, please. Alderwoman Mary Ann Melisa Golia. Present. Alderman Mark Cookson, he's not here. I'm Alderman David Schoenemann. I'm sitting in for him uh, as Vice Chair of Infrastructure. Alderman Dowd. Present. I'm Ms. Kleiner. Present. Paul Bergeron. Present. Mike Rosenblum is not here. Um, I'm Bob Shackle. I'm sitting in for Mike. Uh, Robert Hollowell. And I did not hear from anyone from the Board of Ed. Uh, Commissioner Matthew Plant. Present. Commissioner Paul Garant. Here. Trustee David Pisano. Library uh, Board of Trustees. No one from the library. No. Also in attendance, Alderman McCarthy and um, Director Cummings. Okay. And that's it, right? Yes. So we have um, some a representation from the Board of Ed, the Fire Commission, and the Library Board of Trustees. Um, missing from this evening's meeting. Um, public comment? None. Communications? We have none. Um, you received both, I believe, electronically as well as the hard copies you have before you, the um, strategic planning draft goals that we developed it seems like a lifetime ago when we last met in July. Mm. Um, and so we ended up coming together and identifying seven broad areas for um, goals. And at that time, we had indicated that we thought we should continue working on these groupings. Um, are there any that we think should be combined? And once we had identified what we thought were the um, overarching umbrella goal areas, beginning to look at maybe some um, key objectives under them that would then kind of set a direction for different departments within the city to move forward. So I think the first question I would have for the committee is, what are your thoughts about what we came up with a couple of months ago? Do you see things in looking at this that you think we should be moving together? Um, as you flip through the vision statement, mission statement are included here for you to refer to. Um, and for those who may be watching, I will quickly summarize the draft goals. Um, the first one is promoting um, growth and a sustainable approach to economic development that's consistent with the wider goals and objectives of the master plan and the economic vitality of the city as a whole, providing a safe and well-maintained infrastructure and utility system that is coordinated with existing needs and plans for future growth, continually improve the quality of lifelong education for all citizens so they are prepared for life and careers in the 21st century, provide a healthy and safe community, effectively manage resources to ensure citizens receive great value for their tax dollars. We'll make the city a regional center for arts, culture, and recreation, and ensure that downtown Nashua is a safe, clean, attractive, and accessible urban center. So those are the seven broad areas we came up with. So thoughts, comments, questions? Here we can line them all up and Mm -hmm. Do you want a commission? Here. Do. No. Oh, there. Now we have all three of them. Yeah. Um, anyone? And uh, Director Cummings, please feel free to jump in, or um, Alderman McCarthy, if you have thoughts. Um, Or are we comfortable with these, and do we think we want to move forward with looking at objectives under each of these? Yeah. 
So, do we want to start with the first one in terms of maybe a couple of objectives? Are there, do you have, are, are there enough copies? Uh, yeah, yeah, oh. I, I have mine. Yeah. Okay, all right, I just wanted to make sure everyone had copies. Um, so the first one is um, promote growth and sustainable approach to economic development consistent with the wider goals and objectives of the master plan and the economic vitality of the city. So thoughts about objectives? Mm -hmm. I can write. Yeah, I can if you'd like. You sure? Yep, happy to. So you're thinking there'll be goals under this? Under the, I mean, we had discussed like one or two objectives and not really highly detailed ones, but something that would maybe give a bit of direction to the city departments in terms of where to move Decision -making. And, and addressing this. Because um, just to back up, when we left the last meeting, we talked about how um, uh, although this talks about economic development, it doesn't mean that it's all in economic development, but that there may be other pieces that would, across the city, that would approach this or support this. So giving people a sense of where we want them to go. Alderman Dowd. Yeah. We're getting a lot of pushback from a small minority of people, at least I hope it's a small minority, about not spending so much on the downtown. I don't think we're selling why it's important to have a vibrant downtown to the general public. If we don't do that, I see many of these objectives crashing and burning. So, how do we do that? I'm not sure that we get objections is indicative that the average national doesn't understand the value of downtown. And we can probably do a better job of it, but I think most people here actually do have a good perception of the downtown. Has anybody that's studied world economics and world history knows that the center of any population is, is the key. And right. if you have a regional area without a central place for people to gather, and it doesn't work. Right. And I think, unfortunately, we have a lot of people who don't understand that. <clears throat> so that would give us the first objective, which is promote downtown a to a vibrant downtown. tell the story. Well, yeah. Rather than promote the downtown, vibrant. promote the importance of having a vibrant downtown. <clears throat> and the fact that a vibrant downtown adds to the things that we can do for the people that aren't downtown. Or seriously detract from it. I, I guess that's a good discussion to have for the goals and objectives. But Disney doesn't tell people why it's important for them to go to Disneyland. It tells them they'll have fun there. So in terms of our actual outreach to the public, you know, I think you want to show why do you want to be downtown. Well, I, 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 oh, go, no, no, go. well, I was going to say, I think uh, Alderman Dowd's point, though, was more than just downtown, but that in terms of um, economic development, having a, vi a downtown that's viewed as having vitality um, then helps sustain and develop the whole region. All the studies that I've seen and read, if you don't have 
a vibrant downtown, you're not going to get anybody to come here and invest money in any kind of economic development. And that's going to lead to things that we don't want to see in Nashville. Please. Can yeah, I think the, point? his point was, what was the discussion at Orlando City Hall when they were thinking about doing Disney? So they weren't promoting the fun there. They're saying this is a, a vibrant area that draws people in, that employs our citizens. And yeah, I'm so I think that I'm trying to think about what what is it we're trying to do that gets us to something concrete to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's maybe that your point is that we we have this mission, but when we we got to package it properly and make sure we wrap around it right. where we're going, and this is how we're going to get there. But we have to show where we're going we and why we're going. We have to make a, a better case for why we support the downtown, why we support the downtown merchants, because if they aren't doing well, they're going to close, and that is not going to be good for anybody living in the city of Nashville. And so if we're going to have as a goal that we're going to promote the down economic development of the downtown, then we got to back it up. Just the way I would explain that is the way I always do with downtown, which is that's the locally capitalized businesses, and the money that gets spent there stays here, as opposed to the chain stores on Amherst Street and DW Highway, where the money leaves the state and doesn't yeah, the have any lasting economic impact. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. The one thing that we don't appear to be doing when we're trying to sell something, and I'm talking about anything that we've been trying to do, especially if we're bonding for it, is we're not doing a business case analysis that shows why it's good for the citizens of Nashville. Okay. And if you get that economic analysis, you're going to stop a lot of the discussion because they won't be able to fight it as well, anyway. Tim, get on that one until we have it. <laughs> <laughs> Writing it down. A business case analysis. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I yeah. think that's the, the objective we're going to go through is what, you know, what is the, what is the analysis of how the money flows in downtown, and why that's important. Because I can tell you, the government doesn't flow to hundred billion dollar uh, development of something without a business case analysis because they'd never get the money. But I, I think it's more than just. The flow, I think the flow of money downtown and keeping it local is important, but I also think to um, Alderman Dowd's earlier comment, downtown is in communities where it is, and when you bring someone here, you take them downtown. I can tell you when we came here in 1995, September of 95, um, we came downtown and Michael Timothy's had just opened and Designwares had just opened. And after we did our little tour, people were like, well, where can we go? What can we do? And we were told to go to Portsmouth. Okay, that was September of 1995. And after we moved here, we were told, I was told by a merchant on Main Street, well, it's a good thing you didn't move here earlier after this merchant heard where I came from and where I shopped and what I did. And basically said that Michael Timothy, Michael Buckley opening Michael Timothy's and then the opening of Designware was like a big economic impact for Main Street. And some people in recent conversations have said to me, yeah, that was like kind of the last big boom we had. That's what really started bringing people downtown. So we can look at two businesses that took a chance on Main Street. Three, because Martha's did it. And Martha's too, that's right, Martha's was here. Um, that that that's that's kind of what brought Main Street along and made our downtown appear a little more welcoming and full of vitality and alive back in the mid '90s. Um, but 
when you listen to things that have come out of Director Cummings' office, and like you said, reading things and listening to other people, it's broader than downtown. It's like, yes, small business wants to locate here. Where are their people going to go? Where are they going to show? What are they going to do? Where are they going to take people? Um, and so I think you're right that the economic impact of downtown is bigger than downtown. And, and it, it impacts, bottom line, it will ultimately impact the value of our homes, the resale values mm -hmm. of our homes. Um, and when, we need to consider that. When I, in the early, probably the early 2000s, when the real estate market, one of the other booms, we're in a net, we're in one now, but at the time I used to do rental tours for companies that were hiring young engineers out of UMaine and Pitt. And they weren't ready to buy a home, you know, but they would come out of school and they'd go, you think I can rent an apartment? Uh, my starting salary is 55000 I'd be like, um, yeah, I think you can rent an apartment <laughs> for fifty five. They didn't even realize how good of money back then that was. Um, but that's what I would do was rental tours. And my job was I was paid to just show them around. And my job was to just do that, sell them on the city. And so hopefully they would accept the position because they were competing. And the first place I would take them was downtown. Yeah and showed them everything that we had. We had the National Pride Baseball at the time. I'd see what was important to them as well. And there was people like, oh, are you a sports fan? So we've got one of the you know, historic ballpark, and we had the Pride, now we have the Silver Knights. And then I would take them you know, to Main Street. And generally, the day would end. At the time, we didn't have as many restaurants like we do now. And we had just started the outdoor dining. But I would always take them to Martha's, because at the time, like a brewery, microbrewery was so new. That was like so cool, and they had the candy shop, and then you would, you know, tour. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things to Alderman Dowd's point, I don't think we do it to our citizens enough, because we've had this, obviously, discussion about the Performing Arts Center in the last week. We're not selling, like, I live in Ward 1, so a lot of people, like, out to Ward 1, you know, they're newer to the city. We don't sell to our residents why having a vibrant downtown is important as well. You know, to a lot of people, it's like, well, what do I care? You know, I don't go downtown, you know, and it's just like, well, no, it's extremely important. And I think that's, you know, we're kind of all going to the same place of why it's important. And we've been, you know, there's a lot of good things happening downtown as the economic development director and the mayor are on the front cover of uh, New Hampshire Business Review, right? Um, and it's a great article about how vibrant I did the same week that we. Had a tough week, obviously, with the Performance <laughs> Arts Center and a lot of discussion. Had a great front page article of how vibrant our downtown is and how things are going. So, again, I think we're, we need to do a better job among citizens, our own residents, explaining why it's important to have a vibrant downtown, whether you go downtown and shop or not, you know, or, you know, dine or what have you. Well, that actually brings up a larger issue that maybe we need to look at also, which is. How do we get information out to our citizens? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I've had people say that to me. You know, I've had just in the last week, because obviously it was a hot discussion for a lot of people on both sides, where people like, why wouldn't they vote? You know, why wouldn't you have the performance art? And then other people. And then I've had people in my ward who went, I can't remember the last time I went there. I could care less. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, not that I could care, just it's not important to me. It's just like, I don't know what the big discussion is about. I never go there. And they don't, you know, back to, but we've done why, a significant. Why don't they go there? And, and yeah, well, I mean, the city is larger too, though. So it's like, you know, you do your shopping in your areas and things. Yeah, no, I'm just, I, I mean, I, I understand that the argument is that they don't go downtown because there's, because if that stuff was there, it wouldn't interest them, or they don't know it's there, or, you know. I, I think a combination of both. I think one of the problems, like with the Performing Arts Center, is the majority of people in Nashville don't know what was going to go on there. They don't know why we're doing it. Right. They don't know what opportunities they would have for things to go to because we never said what was going to be take place there. You know, they and they are hearing all kinds of soothsayers making, saying it's going to be a failure like everything else, and, and that's all we understand. They don't, they need the sale on why, and that goes to the business case analysis. How is that going to be vibrant for the city of Nashville? We heard, but it was never stressed, a number of studies on other cities that have opened a center like that and brought in 
10 times the amount of money that it cost them to develop it. And, and the argument about having the arts people do it, my God, if the arts people had the money to do it, they'd have done it 10, 15, 20 years ago. So in, in looking back at this first goal we have, um, the city shall promote growth in an economic, and then a sustainable approach to economic development. Is, is one objective under there then around communication? Definitely. Something about clearly communicating. It, I don't know how many times I've heard it in business. If you can't sell it, you can't get it. I think the issue there is we don't know how to use social media particularly yeah, well. I think the I think the mayor's office and this this in James Veo, the mayor's office has a nice newsletter that comes out. And James Bay, I don't know, is that the same one that James does? Or does James do a separate one? Yeah. So there's two. There's a downtown And one. downtown. But one of the things the city just did, and we talked at length at Public Works about it, um, because we were hiring um, uh, a communication, yeah, a public relations person, uh, per se, was having an app. And the city does now have an app, actually. <laughs> you can download the city's app, Go Nashua. Pretty, pretty good app. Um, and it, it brings you to all the phone uh, phone numbers and contact things. And I think for the younger people, for anybody, because we all have the iPhones, but as far as getting the communication out, it could be a little more user friendly. It's not as graphic -y as it could be, but it's definitely a start. And I think like um, I don't I don't know how that even rolled out. It kind of just rolled out softly, and I don't know if they're, con they're continuing to work on it or, but I just think it's so important that's a central piece because there is some really good information in those newsletters as far as getting the information out. And I think through that piece, that's what we talked about at Public Works, was like social media, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Um, and and I, I think that that's, I would agree with you, that's a real good way to reach a number of people, but I think there's also a number of people, as we know, who don't have internet access or may it, don't have it because they can't afford it or don't have it because they don't have the skills. And so I think we need to say, how do we get to, how do we comprehensively get information to the city? That gets us one group and, and it certainly gets us a fairly nice piece of the pie. But we've still got, again, I mean, we talk about in the schools, kids who can't go home and do homework because they don't have internet access. Their parents live here, their voters here, they pay taxes here. I mean, they, they need to know what's going on and have input. And then we have people, and I'm not even going to say it's seniors, because I know some seniors who are better with technology than some younger people I know, but there are people across the age ranges who just either aren't interested or don't have the skill set. So how do we get information to them? Well, you've got an excellent opportunity coming up with the uh, holiday stroll. You know, you're going to have several thousand people down there. there. There's a marketing opportunity right there. And I agree with you. When we have events, we do that. but. My experience has been that people really appreciate monthly sorts of input. You know, this is coming up for a vote. This is happening. Um, there's going to be a presentation about this. Um, even if you can't go to the meeting, it's going to be on Channel 16, those sorts of things. So how do we reach out to people? And I think Channel 16 is a great way to reach out to people because there are a lot of people who watch Channel 16. I think I think we we have channel 96 and 99 as well, but I think, and I've said this, I think channel 16 is underutilized. Like at the end of the public works meeting, the director always does the director's report. Mm -hmm. they, they have, you know, she always has pictures of all kinds of things. It's, it's really good. I mean, she does mm -hmm. a great job, but it shows all the stuff public works is doing. And I, I've said that, you know, we need to get that on channel 16 scrolling, you know, instead of just coming up and, you know, oh, the weather or what have you. Let's get that scrolling because the most important thing when we get our 140 page packet, the first thing I do is I go to those last three pages to see what's going on, what's been done, right. and what have you. And then the director always has, like I say, and show, and then you go, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff that's going on. 
you know, as far as infrastructure and, you know, new park openings and what have you. So. Right. I couldn't help but just think that you should have that at the beginning of the meeting rather than having to sit through the entire meeting. <laughs> <laughs> For the prize. Yeah, usually, usually by the time we get done, we're all barely talking to each other, so we don't have much comment. We don't have much comment. So that brings you together. <laughs> <laughs> but I would agree. Yeah, Ms. Kleiner. So, there's definitely um, some merit to what Alderman Dad has said, and, and our office has heard it. Um, so we haven't probably done as good of a job with messaging um, on the importance of downtown and the vital vitality of downtown um, to other areas of the city. I think when we have large bonding projects, not just the Performing Arts Center, mm -hmm. but anything major, we have to look at a communication plan on how we're going to go out into these individual wards, and I'm going to be the last one to say town halls, because <laughs> they're extremely <laughs> exhausting, but, but something of that, and, and maybe it's not always the mayor, M maybe it's engaging others as well to be these communication people that go out um, and speak to the citizens and explain the project. Um, lots of times you are not going to get the draw to City Hall for these, you know, oh, there's a presentation of such and such mm -hmm. in the auditorium tonight. And we see it. Um, a lot of times it's the same folks that come in and, and we love it, you know, and we're glad to present. Um, but I think we need to do more outreach into the ward where it's closer for people. Um, it's not always beneficial. Yeah, even at that, though, when we did the board meetings, we might have gotten 50 at one of them. We did typically 20 to 30, so when you're done, we reached 300 people out of 86,000. I mean, I'll tell you, the newsletter, uh, last count, it's still under 700 people. So I'm How does the newsletter go out? I didn't even know about it. <laughs> I didn't get it. Like it just, I went, just went recently, go. right? In the last few days? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I, it, it I guess I'm on the list. Tuesday, it's I'm not. Uh, email. I'm on the it's list. Email. Somehow, I don't know how. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I must have subscribe. signed up for it or something, yeah. Um, you can go on you, the website. You, you'd think the Board of Aldermen would have gotten put on the, put on the list at the yes. beginning, by the way. We could do that, gladly. Um, but you go on to the, uh, to the city website and you subscribe. And it go, it's like a MailChimp type of, but um, we tend to get input from all the divisions. So what's going on in public works, what's going on at the library, um, and I'll send out, I'll send it out, I'll shoot it to the BOA. Um, and yeah, this, and this to one had a lovely um, write up on Dr. Mosley joining the city. And so we reach out to all the division directors and we get that, but still it's only 700 Go to the but I think well, it's a start. It but I, I think that I mean, there's a couple of things there. One, um, we ought to, if you're doing that, we should integrate that with Facebook. We ought to have a city Facebook page where that gets posted as well, because you'll hit thousands of people uh -huh. that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it is on the mayor's Facebook page, but yeah. maybe that brings up. That's a good point. We don't have a city Facebook. Right. Page. Yeah. Right. And as as Paul points out. A lot of people we can hit with Channel 16. What I would suggest is, I mean, maybe we want to do a video version of the newsletter. You know, just have have Jim read it in his <laughs> inimitable style. Um, the other thing is just put stuff on Channel 16 that directs people of how to right. subscribe to it. Yeah. Have him do it a couple of times, and at the end, you know, put a put a thing up for a while that says. Here's how you subscribe to the newsletter. Right. And and I edited a telegram, put him on the list. Yeah. And I would say even you know, if Jim can't do it all the time because it does have information across divisions, even maybe have a division head right. present and say, you know, in the this month's newsletter, there's information about, you know, registering for spring sports read a little bit about parks and rec if you'd like to know more about what's going on in the city 
here's where you can subscribe. Okay. For all the division directors to take a look. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Great idea. And so we have there are a bunch of Facebook directors. <laughs> there's a bunch of Facebook activity. Vio has one, right? So have him connect to this, yeah. or or send to his audience. This is where you sign up for the newsletter, and Alderman Dowd probably has ten or fifteen thousand followers. Most of the old. <laughs> <laughs> most of the Alderman do have pages. Yeah. So. Um, Jim has such a great following in the city that we're well ahead of the game if he had a venue to s try and sell as in accordance with the BCA and the things you'd find from a BCA to sell these, these projects and why they're important. Because then you will get a lot of people in the know and when they hear this, this few who, you know, downplay everything we do, um, it would counter that big time. Okay. So under goal number one, <laughs> I have, we have promote vibrancy of downtown and clearly communic communicating regarding growth and sustainable development. Um, and we can just leave that there and think about things and maybe come back. Um, the second one, Actually, um, may go, I yeah, please, that? yes, um, Alderman Schoenemann. I haven't been at these meetings for a while, so I'm not sure exactly if this is fitting in the same place or in the right place. I'm thinking about um, Milliard Brewery, and when they started up, they had a tough time getting all their permitting. And um, I'm wondering if part of a sustainable approach to economic development um, would be to work on somehow streamlining the process for a new business coming in so that it doesn't take them as long. They told me that um, they could have gone to a different town. A lot of these little breweries are in different towns where it's one guy who takes care of health and takes care of buildings and all this, and the guy comes in and done, and they're open for business. Here, because we're a city, a much larger group, we, we have sp spread a lot of those functions across numerous people and numerous departments, and it just took them a very long time to get going. And I wonder if, if we're talking about, under number one, what the city is going to do to try to make things better, how we're going to manage our internal departments and that kind of thing, if there's some way, uh, and maybe, it's, maybe it was only, maybe that was an isolated case, I don't know. Um, but if there's some way to make sure we're all on board for helping these places get going. Uh, now, I assume that they were able to comply, they're obviously able to comply, mm -hmm. eventually got it all done, but it just, it sounded like it was a long, took a long time. And they spent a lot of money, considerable money, waiting, because they rented their space. They had to rent the space before they can get the inspections. So they rented it for a year before they opened their doors. Right. Right. Here we might go with communication again. Yeah. <laughs> um, They're not so going here. The, the city is working currently on a new software that is going to inter integrate all the permitting. Um, so community development um, and building is the first group that's looking at the software um, and working with the vendor and figuring out um, how it needs to work and flow and then it's going, uh, they're working with DPW, so they'll be the very first piece. Then health will come on board and it will work with health. Um, eventually it's going to also manage um, our events, um, so working with the city clerk, uh, then our dog licensing. Um, it's at least a year um, process, um, but we will have that all online. Um, a lot of it now is that it's not online, so um, you're not getting automatic notifications to other departments um, when a permit is needed and things of that sort. Uh, this will streamline all that, um, but it's quite a large project um, and it's very much in its first stages. I'm not sure that's 
I mean, that's a good thing to do. That's something we really need. But I'm not sure that's all of the problem. I, I think we often get permitting processes and approvals to be a much more adversarial process than it ought to be. I mean, when, when somebody comes in, the goal actually ought to be to get them to open a business. You know, there are things they have to do that we may have to explain to them or figure out how they're going to do that. But it, it, somebody shouldn't just walk in and walk away with the opinion of, I came in, I put the page down, somebody looked at it and said no. But it's, with customer service issues? Yes. Then that, that's, a to yes, the permitting software is not going to solve that. And we should look at that. Well, can I okay. comment on that? About 18 months, two years ago, a business came to Nashville tried to open up these folks that grow vegetables in a trailer 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And they received a very hostile reception. And they went to you. Yeah. And you sent them to us at the airport. And we said, come on down. And we're going to rent you the space and put you out here. Oh, are they, do they have that at the airport? No, they were, we yeah. were all. They're, they're we, we, we had everything ready right. to go. I thought we had and then the zoning board allowed them. Well, yeah. But they, they communicated to us as new business people in the city of Nashua that they received a very, very cool reception. You know, we don't think we really want you here. Basically, is what they want, what they said. Who, do you know who that was? That, where yes. they get that message? Well, they were in the paper yes. a couple of weeks ago where the mayor went out and took mm -hmm. a look at it. I, yeah. so, 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 I, clarify, know, so I know exactly what wait. happened, and we got it, we got it resolved. But, yeah. it, but it's. It, that was a couple years ago. It's an issue. And that's, I mean, that's exactly the sort of thing I'm. You know, this goes. It's a good point. So, so it's communication and it's maybe some training, and well, and making we sure everyone is understands what the plan is. If mm -hmm. we need to look at the rules of what the permit required by the permitting and streamline it so that they don't have that problem. I I. Do. Tell us, please. It's not a great on-camera topic. <laughs> um, I, I have I have one question though regarding regarding all of this in terms of um, looking at at something that I think you know is something we're always looking at. Do we have the workforce within the city? to do things in a timely manner. And I just, I mean, I think we always have to think about that. If people have to wait, oh, what's the impact? And so, and it's probably, it's not something that I think we're going to talk about now, but I think, you know, it's, it's some of these things come down to workforce and of course then the dollars to support that workforce. But what's the payoff by adding another person like adding another inspector that costs us so much, but we're able to issue permits quicker. And, you know, and that's something I think we can only find out when we look more closely at work, but I think though that's something that's always in play. Alderman Shoneman. Um, yeah, just a brief point about the workforce issue. Um, granted, we're a city and these other places are little towns in some cases. But they have a smaller workforce. It's one person who does all those different things. And it's done lickety split. And so we have one, one nano brewery. The state passed that law a number of years ago to make a nice low licensing fee uh -huh. in the city, in the, anywhere in the state if you, you have to go through local permitting. And um, there's only one here. Um, there's a bunch in places like Derry or London Derry or little towns um, because it's a it's just a one stop. And um, maybe the answer isn't to add more people. Maybe it's to get one person who takes care of all the departments and have a staff of four people or six, whatever it is, but each one of them has full responsibility rather than this guy, then this guy, then this guy can't make it, but you can't do this one mm -hmm. until this guy comes in. And it was just on and on and on. And right. more people wouldn't have made the difference. Really, it's it's. You just want one guy to come and take care of everything. That, that, is, is, that, that is true on some of the issues. On things like building inspections, we have a personnel problem. We don't have enough people. 
our inspectors are doing 12 or more inspections a day to keep up with the load. That one guy is doing one every other day. You know? Right. So, I mean, when you look at it, it's, it's, I mean, our guys are spending four hours a day in the car, mm -hmm. just driving from site to site because people aren't kind enough to build right next to each other. You know? <laughs> Uh, well, it isn't an analogy. I mean, the big town, little town thing. I know it doesn't work in all cases, but just finding a way to some of it is we just. I mean, we have a we have more regulations than towns do, um, for for good reasons. You know, as stuff gets denser, you got to be more careful, and it's articulated in uh, legalese, not in you know, simple not, English, not in in drywaller you know it's, yeah. it's it's difficult for somebody whose whose job is not regulation to necessarily understand some of the nuances of that stuff and it's, it that gets to be a problem if we, we we ought to have some kind of advocate who can explain what it is you need to do and we we could do a video series on uh, particularly on things like um, restaurant licensing is is one of the ones mm -hmm. where it's very difficult to understand it until you, you know, mm -hmm. until we say no, and even then you got to ask questions. And 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 I'll and I'll also say, in in defense of the staff, the cases where people find the the relationship to be adversarial, that is often because something they did in the past or many things they did in the past bit them politically, where you know. You, Somebody comes in and we prove a microbrewery and everybody loves it, that's great. If the same business is the first pot dispensary in Nashua, <laughs> which is going to be subject to basically the exact same set of rules, people will get strung up for having approved it quickly because the public goes and complains to the aldermen because they don't like the application. You know, so it's it's very difficult to do that in a in a way that that, you know. Put bluntly, we don't pay the staff enough money to put up with that stuff from us, and and you know we we the city leaders are are the source of some of that problem. So I'd like to go back to your question, the original question about workforce. Um, so last year, when um, the mayor put placed a hiring freeze, uh, we made the determination that if a position came up within the city that needed to be filled, um, that Larry um, Boudreau, the Director of Human Resources, and I would go out and do an analysis of all the staff within that department and how the work flowed. Um, what we found is there are a number of areas that we are short-staffed. Um, and for those areas, we approved those jobs um, to be filled right away. Still, though, there's some areas of the city that you do have some shortages. I mean, the workflow is, is just more than the department can handle. Um, it's something that we've been looking at, and we're still continuing <coughs> to do an analysis department by department. Um, and it's something that I think we have to look at how we work more efficiently, um, how we work smarter. Um, the city's not as technologically savvy as we could be. Um, so we have to look at some of those processes. Um, but it's a larger conversation, and, and we have to move in that direction. Um, so this permitting software is just one area of that. Um, and before you add personnel, <coughs> We want to get through that process mm -hmm. to see how that makes it more efficient or doesn't. And then maybe you have to talk about it. I'm personal. actually glad to hear that's going on. Just one of the things I had hoped would happen when we converted the ERP system over to Lawson is we asked them to analyze our business practices because often when we automate stuff, we don't sit back and say, what is it that has to happen to make this? We look back and say, what is it we've always done? And yes. we automate stuff that happened for reasons that no longer exist. Very true. Mm -hmm.
So, you know, I, I, one of the things I encouraged with that project was do not allow us to ask for modifications to the software that's already there. If there's payroll software and 100 communities or 10,000 communities are already using it, it's very likely we can actually use it unmodified. And maybe, the, maybe if we can't, the problem is us and not the software. So I hope that uh, the meeting is time constrained and not based on getting objectives for all seven mission statements. Because no. We'll be here for no, but I, but I think these are like some, uh, some conversations we have to have. And, and, you know, I think Alderman Shoneman's point, it needs to be um, recognized also that, you know, again, workforce isn't just hiring people, but are there places where you can have one person do multiple things? And I think that's part of the analysis we need to do because that may, in, in reality, be an answer to some of the issues. And we, have, we actually have done some work on that with the, uh, I mean, the building inspectors are used to be, you know, dedicated mechanical and plumbing inspectors, and I think there's a lot more cross-training now. I mean, if you have a complex building go in, we'll probably have sure. our best mechanical inspector do the mechanical inspections, but on an average piece of construction, almost anybody can handle That's those good. inspections. Mm -hmm. I think we can learn from that kind of experience. And right. that gentleman who, who did that breweries and award, so I heard from him periodically. Right. And, you know, it, was, it, just, it just took a long time. And it'd be, it seems to be a fun business. I think people like it, they like doing it, and it's, it's relatively popular from what I understand mm -hmm. and maybe there's more who want to try and it'd be great so right. streamline it right. for next time. Right. Um, anything else with this discussion we want to add to what's up there? I always come back to it. Yeah. Uh, the, next one. the next one is um, a safe and well-maintained infrastructure and a utility system that is coordinated with existing needs and with plans for future growth, which um, certainly ties into the first one. I, I think we're actually doing a fair job in that area with the paving and the downtown improvements and the, the uh, foresight to think ahead for the wastewater plant and the uh, maintaining the hydroelectric system and those things. I think, you know, unless I'm missing something that we should be doing, but I think we have a fair handle on that. Uh, not perfect, but I think we have a fair handle. The objective is to continue the things we're right. doing right. and right. finish them. Right, right. And I we, guess that would be my my comment. What do you think we should put up there that we're doing that we should continue? They will come back and pave the roads that ground up at some point, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no offense, but I some liked my street SMB. better last week when it existed. <laughs> It, it is funny because we have to calls from people. Did you have to do it that day or that week? It's like, come on. Didn't you want your own paint? We didn't have that problem with Tinker Road. Friday morning, there's a grooved pavement sign at the end of my street. I was like, oh, I don't like the looks of that. <laughs> screaming and hollering. When are they going to pay Main Street? When are they, why don't they do it? What's the problem with it? And then they make that left turn off Beach North One. Oh my God, not today. I guess. <laughs> well, that's what, I've got calls Everybody on both. I'm that. like, you're not serious yeah, right yeah. now. It was my feeling yesterday morning. Oh no. So, what is it we're doing that we need to continue? Well, we need to pay pay and be, be, keep the foresight on the wastewater plant because. Okay, so would it be just the wastewater plant or well, no, keeping informed of regulations and potential impacts on the community? Uh, well, I was just thinking across the board things, and that was one of them. I mean, the paving, obviously, you know, we got so far behind, and uh, that had to be done. Um, we've been addressing the schools. Um, and which we probably should have done earlier uh, and you know also in that area there's a lot of miscommunication well, out there the thing we're not doing is providing for any maintenance for other facilities right and we've begun to do that for the wastewater treatment plant um, we certainly do not do it for schools so do we I know on the Board of Ed we 
force our maintenance people to get a list of all the maintenance needs to be done across all the schools. But do we do that citywide? Is there a comprehensive list of all of the city's facilities and what condition they're in and what the plan is to keep them current? There is, I've never seen it. Um, there was a well, master, facilities master plan done. Yeah. Probably about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's the last one that was the last. Yeah. Um, and don't we submit requests to the city? I know the police department did on, I think, capital improvements. Capital improvement, yeah. 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 There's that. Yeah, for, that, you know, that's that's what I've seen. That process is <laughs> wrong, pretty much a joke. Uh, but there, are, there is, there should be, you're right, because and I'll tell you kind of a funny story. We walked into the mayor's office this morning and went to switch lock. Uh, switch the light, no lights. No lights. Um, so the so switch keep them in the dark. inside has died. <laughs> That's our power comes from Puerto Rico. Apparently. Replaced, but um, and you see things. I mean, things arise, and we have. So we just had a meeting on this a couple weeks ago. You have three building people in City Hall that deal with City Hall. Um, hunt. Now the Hunt, now the Arlington Street Building, the Mall Public Court, Health Building, Court Street. Court, Street. Court Street. And you know, you, if you have one out right. for any reason, right. it was in Colts. Um, they cannot handle that load. Um, and it's just regular maintenance items that right. need to be You've handled. Got, you have three. He's got a couple. Fire department has several. Mm -hmm. And it may well be on days when the three that are here are up to their eyeballs. The guys over in fire have nothing to do, and we don't, we don't coordinate that. We don't coordinate. We don't coordinate. You know, I, I have, have several times advocated for us to create a sort of virtual facilities department where we at least yes. get the plan together that, that Alderman Dowd is talking about so we can understand what all the maintenance is and have somebody who's able to reach across the departments and say, why don't you come over and help us with this if you're not doing anything, and so that we can make sure that the most important things are always getting done regardless of where they are. It's, I mean, it's a little tough because, you know, if something that's of importance too to the police department doesn't get done because their guy was doing something of importance okay. one at City Hall. We go, oh my God, why are you tearing our guy off of there? But I mean, that's just the fortunes of war. You, we, at some point we gotta do that. And, and you need to integrate that with schools because mm -hmm. we don't have skilled trades guys in any other department. Right, so I mean, and DBW has a, a good relationship with school ops, so when they yeah. needed an electrician, mm -hmm. they call over there. You know, they've got and electricians and, and plumbers. And yeah, Parks and Rec, Rec so and thing, Sean Smith work very well would, together, would but have, you're right, we don't. One other. thing that would improve that is having a master list of, of the things that need to be done by priority, you know, and you work from the top down. And, and you can then get these, the people that, you know, they don't have any priority one or twos, they can, they're available to come over and start working, you know. Um, but if you had that list, then you wouldn't have to ask, yeah. call somebody up and say, hey, uh, you guys not doing anything? Because you know what they're going to say? Oh, no, we're, we're out full. Up to my ears. Up to yeah. my ears. <laughs> you got to you you understand what the workload is. And mm -hmm. you know, right. at some point we may need to take care of some of that. But, you know, it's like, I don't think, we probably don't even have a list of all of the grass that needs to be mowed. <laughs> no, I mean, no, we don't. Or when? Can I go back? Do, does the city have a capital improvements plan? Alderman <laughs> 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 McCarthy. Oh, yes. there, 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 is, there is a process that's created by state law where things are put on a plan that once a year is ranked by a committee that is um, about half staff and half appointed members that, that have no other relationship to the plan. They rank all of the projects that are submitted um, from top to bottom. Um, the mayor then picks at random which of those he wants to fund and puts them in the budget and the Board of Aldermen at random takes them back out or puts other ones in. So 
The reason I ask is we're doing it at the airport and we're very much engaged in it, but we deal with New Hampshire DOT and, and the FAA. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's an ongoing process and we're... The airport's been ahead of that game for years. One year we actually tried having the division directors get together and, and look at all of the projects and figure out which ones were important from a city perspective. And as soon as that went to be the input to the capital improvements plan, all of the boards and commissions said, well, that's all wrong. Ours is obviously the most that's important important project right. in the city. So, you know, it was, even if you can get the directors to agree on what's important and what is, and what can wait, it then gets absorbed in the uh, government. I'll give you an example of five schools that we just did all the IVAC projects on. That was on the capital improvements list for 13 years or more. Oh, yeah. When I started on the board, yeah. the Lake Street Fire Station had been rated the top project for 13 years mm -hmm. running and had not been funded. It, it certainly was one of the, it's not what I'm used to coming from the private industry. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. What would you like for an objective? Well, I. Oh, you don't have a committee that determines what you what you're possibly going to do six years from now because, in theory, nothing should get done until six years after it goes to capital improvements the first time. Right. It's just I, a rule. Except, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's actually. I guess it has to stand There's a much stronger the connection the with your. In, with your budget system also. I mean, so here, the recommendations, they really are not what might actually weigh them working their way into the budget. Um, and it's not actually even the need either sometimes. So I'm not sure exactly what the correlation is between the capital improvements, recommendations, and the budget. Like everything else in New Hampshire state law, the planning process is designed around a community of 2,000 farmers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not relevant to a city with full-time staff. So, uh, in looking at this and um, him going just from the conversation about coordinating maintenance do we want to put anything under there about some sort of citywide process we definitely want to develop a a facilities plan plan could I convince you to go a little bit further? Yes. <laughs> you know, you know, you're not I mean, here just you, to write. You you're not here just to write. Come on. Command. I mean, you got to think of it. This, this, you're, uh, I don't know what, uh, a quarter of a billion dollar operation sitting on mm -hmm. major assets. If you think about it that way, you need to think about deferred capital maintenance. How are you going to get the best life out of these assets? I, I, you know, it's not my place to be weighing in, but I think Yes, it is. I appreciate that. Please. You, you, want, you want someone who's going to be actively managing that so, so, you, so you get the best bang for your buck mm -hmm. for your taxpayer. That's, that's my thoughts. Yeah. You're 100% you're on. Like with all the talk about going to Daniel Webster and assessing all those buildings there, and certainly if that, that was the route you were going, you had to do that. I'm saying, I 100%, you have to do that to every building we have. Every building we have should have a, a, a whether it's outside consult, however way it was done, you brought in commercial inspectors or what have you and really looked at these buildings and said, well, what is it that we're really going to need on these buildings? So back to DPW, you know, well, it was no on the Burke Street for now. Some people, well, I'm glad that's done. Time out. No, no, no. Right. We're going to have to do something right. to the park rec buildings. That's going to be millions of dollars if we just decide, okay, we're going to stay in Greeley, maybe, I don't know, whatever the plan's going to be, that's a couple million dollars. What's going to be the plan for Burke Street? What's going to be the plan for the street department now that's squeezed in over there? Um, at the county level, we're taking over the state um, leases the, the jail for the women's prison. Well, the women's prison is being moved to Concord. They built a new prison. Mm -hmm. We've gone in, since I, I was there, I said, we're going to get this building back with no maintenance. They were supposed to do maintenance on it. Well, we've already had a commercial inspector go in and, and soup the nuts, inspect this building. And we're, I don't know if any, hopefully they're not watching. When they get done, we'll be going to hold in this report and saying, um, 
what's the scoop with all this work? But plus, we even know what we're, we're inheriting for a building, which is a building that's going to need millions of dollars worth of work, or it's going to have to be raised. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do that, like, I, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. And what happened is, like, back to, like, even when some of the things, and I don't know, not to get into the 50 million for Elm Street, but then right after the thing about the, oh, 50 million for the performance arts, and, oh, this is going to need, well, is it a surprise? Well, it's probably not a surprise to the people who are in the know, but it just, you know, when it's hitting the public, as right. opposed to a master plan of, like, well, we know, like, this one's going to need, X and this one's going to need like citywide, not just this school or Burke or. We actually have a, a a fairly rare opportunity coming up to fix some of this, and um, you know, I, we are close to paying off the bonds on high school, and a number of other things that will be that will come off the debt service in the near future. So debt service is going to drop substantially between 2020 and 2025. We ought not to let that happen. And I say that because when I came onto the board, our debt service and capital improvements were somewhere less than 5% of, of the budget. And if you look nationally, communities um, try to be at about 10% so that they can keep up with those things. We got there. Um, when the state revenue sharing started and we built the high schools, we were able to absorb that. And having fixed that issue and gotten to the point where we actually can afford infrastructure. I mean, when I started, the capital improvements submissions were this big. They're now like that because we, we've gotten most of the schools renovated. We've gotten, you know, a police station rebuilt. We've gotten the fire houses rebuilt. We've done a lot of the stuff that we needed to do. We can now start trying to keep up with that. So we need that plan so that over the next 10 years, we can have projects slated so it's, so it's no surprise and so that they slide into the budget right. to replace the existing debt that's paid off, you know, so that, we, so that we don't let that number slide back and we can increase it the way, you know, the way any budget item normally increases with inflation to get it to stay constant in terms of percentage of the tax rate. And, you know, the, the stuff we do with that is the stuff that, that really makes the community valuable. So we, we need to do that. We've looked at the facilities department. Very difficult to move the employees around, but I think we can do it in some virtual way of get somebody who is, you know, the, the designated responsible individual, or as my company likes to call them, the single throat to choke. Um, <laughs> for, for, for facilities management so that we get that plan together because we we just we we don't we never take that duty seriously when it comes up and we don't have the resources you know consistently there to make sure that we're going to do that so I, I think um, that's one of the things I'd really like to see us go back and look at again we started to look at it once before um, I have had some conversations with Manchester about the way their stuff works, and they seem to have a pretty good way of doing that. You know, and, and I mean, the, we're going to have to deal with that with the school department at some point. And it's you know really, it shouldn't be up to the departments to maintain their buildings. They're basically tenants in what should be the city's real estate arm of maintaining you know our building inventory so that. I mean, public health spends more time dealing with facilities issues than they ought to. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. you know uh, one of the things is that I think there's, again, to the communication point, there's a lot of people out there that when we start talking about a $15 million art center or a $50 million school, which, by the way, that number is fictitious. It, no one has done an analysis of that number. And they think somebody's going to sit down in the city hall and write a check for that amount of money. That's not the way bonding works. Right. You, you, it'd, be, it'd be over a number of years. And, and the overall bonding amount for the city, you know, fluctuates along a fairly steady line. And there are other people that think, well, we ought to eliminate all bonding, you know, so we can reduce our tax rate. You can't do that in a city. 
you can't afford to get the things you need to function as a city without bonding. And there's just a lot of people that don't get it. Or don't want to get it. Yeah. Uh, yeah so communication. Point out, with, yes. with, with regard to Elm Street, I mean, it, a lot of what we're seeing now is a failure of planning. Many years ago, we got an estimate to do a $12 million rebuild on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. We budgeted six. We spent that six. We spent another six over the next few years to fix some other problems. And we spent another six on top of that. And now we find we're still way behind because we didn't actually fix the problem the first time. And the other thing is, you know, for 40 years as a professional logistician, I used to make plans for the government on how to support multi-million dollar or billion dollar weapon systems and they plan this is going to last 20 or 30 years and plan accordingly at the end of that time gone replaced we don't do that we don't look at anything that we're you know buildings have a finite life and, and especially if you don't take care of them hmm. you know now you can spend some money today and they get and you'll get more life out of it but if you ignore it like our old high school it was a disaster. When we started taking that building apart, we found systems that were rusted shut. Right. It's insane, you know, and, and it was built on a low dollar. So again, you, you pay me now, pay me later. So we built the high schools, we built them the last in 10, 12 years, how long? They're still in really 13. good shape. Yeah. 13, yeah. Actually, yeah. Uh, North is 15 years old this yeah. year. Ooh, I just got older all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's 13 since both of them have been open. Yeah. 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 So, facilities plan and more, and um, Commission, or, um, Director Cummings knows what that means, so he will be typing that. So, I'm, that's um, <laughs> the other part of number two, uh, just in case there are any thoughts about it, is um, talking about utility system that's also coordinated with existing needs and plans for future growth. And if the record could indicate, Alderman Cookson has joined us. Hello, thank you. Good evening, thank you. Um, there's paper, right? yeah. So anything else around um, utility system? Any thoughts? Come back to it. I think if uh, we get the plan, then we go a long way to answering a lot of the questions in that particular. Okay. What did we mean by utility system? We had talked about coordinating things like electric and and basically utilities and looking at how that works, those private things with our okay. city infrastructure. It's interesting because now you have. So Madeline Mendio is working with the Energy and Environment Committee, and this is an area they've gotten really actively involved. We just got, I know that Sean Smith had gone, brought in an agency to their finance committee on solar, um, and, and he has forwarded us that information now. I think it's the energy part of it. Mm -hmm. We've realized that there's, um, that report needs to be have some update as well, um, and Madeline started to look at that. So there's quite a few members of the Energy and Environment Committee who have some um, real specific knowledge on that, and they'll be helping her out. So it's just something that's starting to get off the ground. Yeah, there's a city just south of Nashville. I'm not sure which one it is, but it has a solar farm right on top of their former landfill. And I'm assuming oh, that that's that's uh, Tingsboro. Tingsboro. That they're getting a lot of their power from that because it's pretty good size. There's a, there's numerous ones. There's another one right over the state line on uh, 111 that went in mm -hmm. last year. Uh, we should be looking at those in numerous places. Yeah. Great. So we should certainly look at them on the schools. Yes. You know, we have the, the advantage with the schools of solar produces energy at the time we actually need it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
there seemed to be a good conversation between the Board of Ed and, the, and Sean Smith and the vendor. But we do, we have a tremendous piece of, of uh, very open real estate at the top of the old landfill. Mm -hmm. So do we want to put anything updating the plan um, on a regular basis? Just put it in there as a marker and we'll come back. This is obviously not our final shot at this. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Okay, um, the next one, Nashua will continually improve the quality of lifelong education for all citizens so they are well prepared for life and careers in the 21st century. Again, I think we're doing a decent job as a region, I'm not sure about the city, but there are a lot of coordinating efforts with <coughs> Nashua Community College mm -hmm. and from for instance, BAE's got a, a cooperation going with them, teaching soldering and other things. And, and, um, and so I think there's a lot of it going on. Um, maybe we just need to see what it is, whether we could add to it, or at least report on it. Other thoughts? Yeah, we had tweaked that one at number three, so I think mm -hmm. we did a good job because we had talked about Doubt Learning Center, the Community College, Riviera, RISE program, a lot of good education, charter schools now in Nashua, a lot of good educational opportunities. I don't think we always back, you start thinking about it and you think, oh wow, it's like. I think that they start to look at a strategic plan process, you know, it, Dr. Mosley brought it up at the opening ceremonies of which, you know, this is the first time in over 10 years that all the teachers were together for an opening ceremony and hearing the message from the superintendent all at once. Um, it, was, it was really something. And I think as they start to look at that under Dr. Mosley, um, we'll start to see some movement forward in at least some objectives. We did a very extensive strategic planning process with the schools, yes. probably close to 10, between 10 and 5 years ago. I remember. <laughs> and it generated a lot of goals. Um, at the time, I believe that a lot of those goals were very watered down from what they should have been. And I believe they have since been essentially thrown out. So, get a status on that. They have a strategic plan, but it's something that it's just like three goals that the Board of Ed put together right. a year ago. Hopefully, with um, some stability over there, they'll move forward and look at more. When when we had talked about this, um, part of their conversation had been um, to what Alderman Dowd had talked about earlier was the city's role in um, supporting businesses in coordinating with not only our high schools but also the community college. And so, you know, how do we do that again? Um, how do how do we pave the way so um, as businesses are looking to move in, we show them this is what's available, or we talk to them and they say, hey, your workforce is great, but then we're also looking for this. So how do we, how do we use, use education to support our economic development, and how do those two things go hand in hand? And um, I know Director Cummings and I at one point talked about um, what was happening up north in Rochester where this business came in and, and they sat down and said, okay, this is what we're going to need. And they put something in place and um, at the presentation, he and I and, and Alderman um, McCarthy and I believe Alderman Dowd, you were there. Um, you know, they talked about how they were looking at a training program that would basically support that business for 20 years in providing a skilled workforce as they anticipated what their needs would be, not only with the business as it moved in, but 
their desire to expand and what they would need in a bigger workforce. What, so one of the things that we identified is, is in the newsletter, which I will send out. Yeah, All the big books in. Yeah, have you received the Sydney newsletter? newsletter? <laughs> okay, oh, yeah, none, yeah. none of us have either, so we you just will. decided. By 11 o'clock tonight, you will. I did. Um, well. the, one of the things we noticed was years ago, I guess, there was a system where the city worked, the city divisions worked with the school system. Um, and they had these career type days and they mm -hmm. fostered these relationships um, between our high school students and our city divisions so that they knew what careers were within the city that you know maybe they're not looking for a four-year college um, but maybe they want to might be interest, interested in a um, opening at wastewater that's entry level. Um, we haven't done that for a number of years, so we sat down, all the division directors, um, with Dr. Mosley. Um, we're looking at putting together a program um, to start next summer, um, where we have a program and we take kids through and they rotate through and learn about the different city divisions. Um, you know, we're, we're a large employer we should be doing this education um, as well as other companies in the city. And I would, I, I would I was just speaking to um, City Clerk Piazza yesterday about the idea of bringing in uh, interns to work within her department um, for records management. And you know, maybe there's a, a nice correlation between a program either at Riviere or at the community college that focuses on records management and, and that could assist her. It just happened yesterday, at that conversation. So um, it's it's interesting to hear the thoughts that are that are going forward as far as how we can engage the community and bring them into um, and, and leverage their their knowledge and um, provide them a resource to further their education and at the same time leverage their knowledge to assist us. Um, where we have shortages in manpower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Public health is very good at that. Right. So public health is probably the one division who's the strongest right. and um, have a very strong relationship with um, Riviera and the nursing program. Mm -hmm. um, but there's others, so there's this large push in education right now for um, ELO, extended learning opportunities, and offering children other ways to learn versus just the traditional classroom. And if we can provide some opportunities where we're getting the students um, to assist us and they're actually earning an ELO, ELO credit, it's a win-win for both sides. Um, and it's something we need to do a lot more further development on, um, but there's finally that discussion between the city and the school district um, in having that conversation. Right. And we, I would, we had it, but, but we had it with, you did it, with yeah. Hollis, the oh, Hollis okay. School District, not in Nashua. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I would think the the advisory boards that are available for each of the programs within the Career and Technology program, um, you have a wealth of knowledge there and people who um, are already invested in our students at le you know at that level. Um, who are there to support us in doing that. Um, I would think at, at the larger community level, involvement of the chamber or other professional organizations within the city um, would be important in terms of looking at what businesses are there providing career opportunities, um, shadowing experiences just so people can get to know what what are today's jobs looking like um, not that when they graduate in six years from college it's going to look the same but at least have a sense of what's out there and, and what employers are looking for at BAE they have somebody that's responsible for interns and their job is twofold one is to 
go into the company and find out who needs or would like interns, and then going out into the, the school system, be it high school, college, and and bringing the interns in. And usually they get more applications than they have mm -hmm. slots to fill. And they have mentored people from high school right through college, giving them summer employment, and then when they graduate, they've been hired. We, we just hired somebody that was an intern at the wastewater treatment plant when he graduated from college he went whatever his field was supposed to be he didn't like it and he came back and he was working full-time at the wastewater treatment <laughs> plant you know it's those are good jobs back to miss yeah. uh, um, Kleiner was saying those are really good jobs I mean you know electricians and mechanics and things and you know they're starting at 20 21 22 dollars an hour with a great benefits package and like the trades, the same thing. Nobody yeah. goes into the trades anymore. Electricians and plumbers and <laughs> framers, they're running the new construction sites. The contract is on. The electrician's running the con because you can't get them. You know? I was so this impressed that your uh, BPW day, the day the skate park, park opened, yep. and meeting all those people that are working for BPW, and a lot of them look like they've been there two years, three years. They're all young people. Yep. It was amazing. Yeah. But those are good jobs, back to, you know, interns and some of the partnership with the, you know, the community college and the trades, because not everybody wants to go to college for four, five, six years right. and then go, I don't know what I want to do, when you, <laughs> you mm -hmm. can, you know. So is there anything else? I, I've got education, <coughs> excuse me, related to career possibilities um, and options. Um, Get the intern thing down. The other thing I would like to see us do, it's difficult, is to coordinate um, volunteers from some of our businesses actually doing work in the school system. We have a lot of uh, extremely good subject matter experts on math and science and technology in the community. Um, there's a lot of them that would love to give back in that way, and it's just, there's no, I, I don't think there's a good program to do that. There are, I, I've run into some people who have done it, but I don't think it's well understood you know, how to become involved in that, and I don't know that we make broad use of it. Yeah, he used to, years ago, anyway, he used to send engineers over to help in the schools. And as I recall, it was some kind of an issue relative to compensation. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the issue was, but it sort of stopped it. Seems to me like something that would be outside of our scope of control, though, wouldn't it? it? That would be more in the in the purview of the board of education, and well, they're they're part of this committee. Uh, well, I so. understand that, but it would be up to them to decide yeah. how it would be implemented. Yeah. Right, right. But I think we can set it as an objective to take advantage of that. Um. Coordinating that connection between um, businesses and individuals with um, the Department of Ed, and um, thinking beyond that, looking at the lifelong education and, and educating um, adults, um, coordinating maybe that connection between businesses and our. Um, our institutions of higher ed that are within the area that would provide some training because I think um, you know certainly there's there's retraining that's going on also um, and making people aware of what's available and meeting businesses needs yeah I, I know our CTE director have done a lot of work with working with businesses to bring businesses into the CTE right. programs. Um, 
the challenge is probably with volunteers on an overall that position that has organizes volunteers um, has been cut, you know, limited hours. Um, so now each school is kind of, you know, the PTOs and to um, help um, just doing their own type of volunteer work. So it's probably not as coordinated as it could be, but the CTE directors do a lot working with the businesses, especially now the new advanced manufacturing CTE mm -hmm. has come up. Um, and there was, they must have had probably 10 or 12 businesses around the table getting their input and their work and putting that program back online. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone? Thoughts? Um, the next one, provide a healthy and safe environment. And um, we had talked about public health, we had talked about police, we had talked about safe stations, um, talked about fire, all coming under this umbrella. Objectives, thoughts about it. And to maintain morale, don't lose any ground. Um, I think the police, fire, public health do a good job. Um, I do know, and having talked to the chief, that uh, there's still several officers short on what they're allowed because they can't get anybody to hire. There's a lot of things that drive that, so maybe it's something to look into, but um, they're doing a good job of what they got. So continue in their coordination of service delivery and mm -hmm. resources? And, and I think better now than ever is the cooperation between the various groups, police and fire, mm -hmm. and public health. It does seem to be pretty good now. We hear yeah. all the time about them working together on different challenges. In, a, in that same vein, uh, when they had that issue of Broad Street the other day, uh, I went over there and I had never seen so many vehicles and people addressing a single issue. But again, it was at an elementary school um, and it could have been very serious. Uh, but we had the local fire department, we had the state, we had the, even the uh, military, the, Air, the National Guard there with their portable lab, and they analyzed that nine ways to Sunday, and I still don't think they know what I suspect the men in black were there, we just don't know. It yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seemed that way. Yes. May I add one thing? Yes, please. Um, I go to some of the crime watch meetings. There was a new one that was started up um, in the north end, mm -hmm. almost to the border of Hollis out there, whatever that next to Merrimack, I guess. Yeah, um, those are really good, I think. And we talk about um, providing a healthy and safe community. I think that part of that is sort of promoting a healthy and safe community. And the, the crime watch meetings do a lot. A lot of times these things start and they have a strong following for a while maybe they fall off a little bit but then a new one starts and maybe the fire department maybe some other departments could join at some of those meetings um, but the last one that i went to that brand new one mm -hmm. there were a lot of people there and that's establishing and getting people involved in this sense of community that involves the police department which you know is is a big factor on city safety and that kind of thing and um I think we should continue to encourage those and maybe have more than just the police department attend okay. some. Yeah. Yeah. It gets back to the first discussion we had at the beginning of the evening. Communication. Is, Communication, is it, yeah. I mean, those things, the ones I've been to are more community meetings than, mm -hmm. than just crime watch right. meetings. Right. right. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a good way to... Uh, they're a great way. And a lot of people, like we talked about before, they're not doing the social media. Maybe a lot of the, maybe some of those folks at those meetings are, but 
There are probably some that aren't. Yeah. And but they're out there talking to their to their neighbors. Right. And that's a great way to communicate. You need to let somebody know when they're communicating with the neighbors. So those those kinds of pocket events in various places in the evening, you know, not in a municipal building, but in someone's home, um, do a lot to establish and promote, you know, healthy, safe environments. Right. So and and I, a lot of those meetings, there were people that were concerned about police response, and when the police go and explain how that response is handled, then they're more knowledgeable and they, and they feel more comfortable. So sure. I think it's a it, it is a good venue, and the, the officers that go and do that know what they're talking about. They, they do, and a lot of these things are based kind of on perceptions, mm -hmm. and it's a person's feeling. You know, it's, right. it's it's very subjective, and so if you can help in a subjective sense, make someone feel better through these kinds of things, I think we're we're getting a lot of. Right traction out of those in my mind. And it seems like it's small, you know, it's here and it's there, but it's it's not without its effect. Right. Well and I would agree. I think and I think the people who go to them tend to go back and then talk to their neighbors who right. weren't there. And and once people get on the list for emails, even though they may not show up, they're still getting information. So there still is that involvement even if it's not face to face at the meetings. And yeah. building a sense of community. I mean yeah. I know um, it, I was somewhere where it was mentioned that um, at that event, it was a high school graduation, 80% um, of the students who were graduating were not from Nashua families. So in terms of just connecting and building that sense of community for the many people who are new to our community and, and helping them know their neighbors um, goes towards promoting a safe community. Commissioner so the, yeah, the big thing there was that and Alderman Dowd said the police department's doing a pretty good job and it's a safe area. That's a big part of it is the community policing. And having the resources to do that is pretty, is pretty big. So I'll bet that that first meeting of that group that you went to, I'll bet the chief was there. Chief Maybe was there. One of the Ethnicious deputies. was there. Yeah, I think one of the deputies was there. Mark Hasbaka. FBI. I, I take the, yeah, he often goes to these. Yeah, mm -hmm. see, so yeah. that's all having the resources to reach out to the community is a big part of keeping mm -hmm. this yeah. whole thing safe. And, and they usually have the district officer that's covering right. show up mm -hmm. as long as he can. Right. Yeah. So he doesn't get a call. Yeah. It's a lot of resources, a lot of people you saw there. Exactly. And, you know, things came out of that, that meeting that didn't involve police work at all. Right. Uh, yeah. They involved, involved the paving schedule. Oh, really? <laughs> and so the paving schedule has been adjusted yep. to include you know, it all that street. <laughs> yep. um, because it made sense. It was a little cul-de-sac off a street that was being paved. The cul-de-sac was going to be done next year, and so they were concerned about that. It's now all on the schedule. It's going to be done at the same time. So a lot of things come out of sure. these that don't oh. relate strictly to police department yeah. stuff. No, or, you're spot on about community, though, because so many times, like, the DPW things, many times, like, people, it's like, well, we didn't know. Like, somebody, you get, by the time somebody, like, emails or calls, they're angry, and it's just like, well, let's go take a look. We didn't know. <laughs> you know, or there's an issue, people know their neighborhoods better than, you know, we do. Mm -hmm. well, and we, we have a pretty good relationship in that respect. Yes. My neighbors all know about your bear messages. And, yeah. And you know when I find us. Uh, drain sinking, etc. And I and a house that's not being maintained yes. that gets maintained and sold, and now yes. it's being lived in. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, one of the things, and I think the difference is in Nashville is Nashville has a great coordination of services between. So when you look at why Nashville's safe station program is working so well. Right, and our, our numbers are, are kind of hovering. We've had o over 800 people now um, walk into a station. It's not just the fire department, although God bless them, they're doing a tremendous job. It's the whole coordination. So having Harbor Homes as a, as a key partner to this um, has been instrumental because when you look at Manchester, and they've been struggling with that piece, and um, and ours is flowing so well. It's because our fire and our police and Harbor Homes and public health and um, you know even emergency management, Justin over at emergency mm -hmm. management, 
they really coordinate and work together so effectively um, that, you know, I've we've just heard today, you know, it's, it's been over five or six days and um, there hasn't been any overdoses within the city. So, you know, not even calls for Narcan. Narcan. That's, That's great. It's great. Um, but it really is them all working together. You don't have one piece of it in the system as well. Right. So not just that coordination within, but coordination throughout the community, between the city and the community. Okay, the next, it's yeah. Just a really quick question. A, a lot of that conversation, in, in my opinion, centered around the safe, the safety aspect. What was, what was the thought around the term healthy and... Part of the healthy piece was around the drug, the whole drug issue that came up. Okay. So yeah. It's, so not, it, not necessarily the, the, the physical fitness, uh, but... Not that it, that is isn't important. No, it's important. Right. Well, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. What's the definition of healthy and how are, how is it being... Uh, explored in this goal. Um, I understand the safe component, the safe community, yes, yeah. but when you eliminate safe and you just have the city of Nashville will, will provide a healthy community, I just wanted to under, better understand what healthy and how healthy was defined in, in that aspect. And um, Alderman Cookson, we, we took, as you know, mm -hmm. the things off of here. And healthy... I'm just quickly looking at this in the small print. Um, I don't, I don't see anything related to your comment, but it doesn't mean it's not an appropriate thought. And and to that point, do we talk about the way um, the city? And I always think of Parks and Rec as being the primary deliverer of that service. But how do they connect with other agencies such as the Y, the Boys and Girls Club, PAL, Girls Inc., um, in providing opportunities that and promoting health and a healthy lifestyle? Because certainly, um, it's something that I know our health department does, both in terms of nutrition and exercise. Um, and, and we coordinate with community development around um, walkability. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a much bigger piece. So how do we, uh, should I add a bullet here? Coordination between city departments and community agencies in the hospitals? Yeah, both hospitals provide quite a bit of um, courses, training, work with people on, on different aspects of healthy. Um, I think there's a lot of it going on. Is it all coordinated? I don't know. I, I'm, not just not, I'm not trying to force fit something No, in. no. I, I think it's an important point because I certainly know from working with um, some of the people in the health department, there is a lot that goes on. And we've had numerous conversations about healthy lifestyle and you know, packing healthy snacks, packy, packing healthy lunches, um, working with families around um, shopping and healthy choices. So, I mean, those con those conversations are all happening, and I know that it's um, a pretty large part of what's happening, as well as things like exercise and walkability. So I think it's appropriate. And, and, and when I was on the board of directors at the Y, we were doing Prescribe the Y, Right. And we had programs about um, diabetes and, and obesity and what to do about those aspects. Right. So, so um, again, right. I just, I didn't know what, what that meant within this particular goal. And it was, I don't think it was necessarily addressed in what we were identifying as bullet points for right. objectives. Right. No, I, if, uh, yeah, and no, I think. No, that's spot on. Yeah, no, it should yeah. be. And, and I think, you know, even in terms of the programs you were talking about, uh, diabetes is certainly, unfortunately, now a multi-age, multi-generational kind of issue. But um, even looking at how we know programs in the city are coordinating with the senior center mm -hmm. and doing programming over there. So um, it, 
there's a lot of that happening and certainly our health department's involved, but it should be something we should be looking at. And the police department certainly does some around the safety with the senior center. So it is pretty far reaching. There's the new one with public health and the schools. So we've known for a while that with children that have asthma, they tend to have higher um, attendance absences, problems, uh, yeah. absences in the schools. So public health is working with the school nurses um, and got a, some assistance in helping them develop a plan on how to deal with these children that have asthma and maybe work with their parents to help develop a more steady plan to hopefully keep them in class. Um, so it is something that public health is very um, actively involved in. St. Joseph's Hospital actually contacted the community center about providing exercise um, classes within the community center. So the hospitals reach out quite a bit to the, to the city. Mm -hmm. I'm putting healthy lifestyle choices mm -hmm. and slash cho choices and we can wordsmith it when we <laughs> get it. The next meeting. The next mm -hmm. meeting. Um, City of Nashua will effectively manage resources to ensure citizens receive great value for their tax dollar. I think we had a little bit of this conversation earlier as we were talking about bonding. Um, are there things that... Mm -hmm. And maintenance schedules, right? That's kind of an important thing that right. I wonder if it's being done consistently. That facilities plan, all that dovetails into it. Mm -hmm. So your resources re uh, is with regard to human resources as well as physical plant resources? Right, that's what we had talked about. Okay. We had talked right. about um, earlier, we had had a conversation about all of this is requires us to look at the human resources as well as the financial resources and um, we had had a conversation about sometimes one person needs to be cross-trained in multiple things so they could go out and do a job more efficiently than sending three people out at three different times and um, Kim talked about looking at workflow and analyzing that um, so um, but that doesn't address the physical plant. The, the, the right, but we had process. talked about, and we had talked about some of that in terms of the physical plan mm -hmm. too, looking at um, how maintenance is being used in the city and if school maintenance isn't plan. being used but the city needs help, do we call someone? So is there something comprehensive? We don't have an up-to-date plan on the, on the building infrastructure in the entire city. Over five years or more before it's ever been updated, and, and we also talked about coordinating the the maintenance of all those facilities, uh, where we have pockets of, of maintenance people, uh, and sometimes, like here in City Hall, if some one of the maintenance guys is missing. The mayor is without a light <laughs> all today. <laughs> where we may have somebody over the fire station that's in maintenance. Yeah, we should probably fix the right now. They can go over and come over here. But you need somebody to coordinate. So you're talking about a centralized versus decentralized. Yeah. Not, well, yes, but not necessarily <laughs> bringing them all into a central department, at least yet. But somebody coordinating so that you can use the people from different groups. During, um, <clears throat> during my last years in the military, that's exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, on an installation or installations that were co-located, like in San Antonio, you have multiple Air Force bases that share a fence. Yep. They consolidated all their maintenance and put it under one hat and then prioritized what needed to be done. And so you didn't have the Army maintenance people and the Air Force maintenance people. There was one maintenance group that, and of course, obviously they were probably competing for the attention of that, but that yeah. happens everywhere. But that's exactly what they did do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, to my knowledge, it worked out rather well. So move to what they call the gray forces. Yeah. Um, where, and there's a lot more of it today because it's a cost and efficiency right. thing where you'll see a group of, of, of military working on something and two may be Navy, two might be Air right. Force, and three Army, you know. Yeah, the purple uniform concept. Concept. Yeah. 
they still keep their own uniforms. And they'll be rid of those. Um, I'm assuming that's going to be, a, if we were to move in that direction, it would potentially become a collective bargaining agreement <laughs> issue. I think that's why we wind up doing it in a so, virtual yeah. way instead of yeah. physical. Yeah. yeah. Instead of physical. Yeah. It, I mean, the, the major impediment is the multiple pension systems. What advantage of the military? No unions. <laughs> Association. Yeah. Not much pushback from the employees. Yeah. <laughs> Not for very long. So, I, I mean, the, the term effectively manage. <laughs> I think is I think effectively becomes a, a difficult term to to qualify, and especially as you're working with multiple groups and, and multiple unions and and who ultimately I mean you're working in a you would be working in a matrix organization with you know I don't know who ultimately would be designated the leader or the the manager of that group, but how do you how do you get these resources to buy off on that concept when they may eventually go back to their union and say, it's not within my contract to do this? So I, think it's a, I think it's a larger it's issue. It's why we defer to the mayor's office. <laughs> it's, it's a <laughs> Come, we'll work it out tomorrow. Yeah, right after she sends out the newsletter. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's a challenge. And I think we know we there's been talk for a number of years about how do we bring different groups together and what you bring up is what where we always end up. How do we how well, do we make we, this and, happen? And we do very little to address it. So I, I mean the, the the simplest and not the simplest, the, the, the most recent example of in of, Everything comes back. It always comes DPW. back to yeah. DPW. So, I mean, I know that we've heard this in the, in the chamber before when a grounds crew or mowers will be passing each other on the field and, and one is, you know, parks and rec and the other in the other direction comes from uh, schools. Schools. So, you know, if we can't solve that problem, and I don't know if we've solved that, that problem or if, if that problem is exists or if it's, We've effectively resolved it, but I mean that in in its simplest form is what we're competing or or, or fighting against. I think they've effectively solved that because I'm talking to Sean Smith. I think they have a great cooperative. Okay. So how do we spread that? How do we get right. that to work for other pockets within the city so that we can effectively manage the resources? I think the way you do that is we've got to we've got to basically set a set of common goals and convince everybody that working to those common goals is in the best interests of everybody involved. You know, I think we, we get situations where, where, you know, we have stovepipes mm -hmm. and people in one stovepipe will fight with people in the other stovepipe because their concentration is on the stovepipe and not the end goal. And it doesn't just happen in you know, municipalities, I mean, this is what we fight against in, in the corporate world every yeah. single day. Yeah. So, I mean, we're experienced with stovepipes and funnels and, you know, yeah. silos. I, I would say, you know, the place where I always think of it working well, and well, most of the time it works well, is when we look at just plowing around the schools. I mean, DPW does this school, and the school department does that school, and, and it's shared. And there's a common goal, we need to get the schools open. But again, it's that common goal. And, and you know, it's kind of forced by the emergency, but, you know, that, that same approach may need to be transferred to just the daily routine of things. And, yeah, and that, showing the benefits to each facility of why this would be good for them. Mm -hmm. So if well, you have an and, electrical problem and your 
electrical person per se who generally would do that work is out, maybe somebody from the school department electrician could come over and vice versa. Well, I don't, I don't know that we have licensed electricians. No, I don't mean, but I'm else. saying right. yeah. everyone has a different skill set is yeah. I guess right. what I'm saying. There's right. certain people where it's like, oh, I would call John for that, but I might call Sarah for this one, you know, or whatever. And I, it's got to be shown a benefit of where right. so, it would so, be benefit for all of the absolutely. facilities. I think that's great. Would, and so I'm just asking and throwing it out there. Would it make more, would it be advisable or suggested that um, this, for this goal, could we say something like to the effect of the city will effectively manage resources by reinforcing common goals to ensure that would, I mean, would that sort of, you know, establish how we're going to do it. We're, we will establish those common goals so that you understand why it's of a benefit to, so that we can manage these resources. Well, right. frankly, I think that's an objective that, that every one of those needs. I mean, that's probably... Yeah. Okay, so, right. the, so the overarching is through common goals, goals. or something yeah. like that. I mean, okay. right. yeah. you know, fine. Yeah. It, if we all understand why we're here, it'll go better. Right. right, so so in addition to these common goals and just drafting, or not drafting them, but eventually adopting them, there's, I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of communication plan to reach out to every single employee within the city that says, this is what we're trying to do as a city and this is how we're going to go forward. And, right. and as we had talked the about this... <laughs> Ooh, right, and as... Three bullets per yeah, <laughs> and as we talked about this... Um, the process that was envisioned was that this document, once finalized, would go out to the department with those common goals, and then they would say, this is how we're going to respond to this. This is our role in doing this. And that they would so then... So they would develop an action plan, plan and right. to implement. Right, right. right. But, but I, I think something happens before that. I, I think before your departments even get these goals... Or, or at the same time that they receive the goals, I think there's this overarching message that's delivered from the corner office. Right, that says, absolutely. This is the message, and we've got police there. We've got, so very similar to how Dr. Mosley pulled all the teachers together. Mm -hmm. We've got to get, you know, the mayor and everybody together from every single department, division, um, uh, office, whatever the, you know, fire, police, everybody, and just say, Here's the message. This is where we're going as a city. And he ultimately becomes the CEO of, uh, again, this organization. Right. And I think and the intermediate step forward. there is to get all the department heads together and make sure they're all on the same page before you bring in people under them. And right. But the, the, the spirit of cooperation is inherent in a, in a manager's slash supervisor's position. Perhaps it should be spelled out specifically in their job description that this is an expected performance factor in your... Who doesn't already say that? I mean, I, I assume it's inferred, but... We're not in competition with one another, we're... Right. It's one city. city. Yes, it's one city. Alderman Schoenman's waving at me. Um, Please, jump in. He's too much of a gentleman. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. The, um, we talked about unions before and work rules and whatnot, and you heard the stories about volunteers wanting to come in and paint at a school and being told they couldn't do it mm -hmm. because it's taking the job away. If someone's out in one department and they bring in someone else from a different work unit, is there going to be a grievance filed? Because this, so it isn't just a matter of, of announcing something. It's, there's some, there's right. some right. clauses and right. contracts well, that gotta, are affected uh, by this kind of thing. Get, I mean, you got to get buy-in that you do. we're all better <laughs> off. I, I will yes. tell you that our current city attorney has a different belief on some of the volunteer issues than predecessors may have had. So, you know, sometimes we work on absolute facts, sometimes we work on what we think might be true. Okay, all I know is what I heard. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know how that came to be, what happened with any of I, I mean, I've, I've heard it, and, and there have been opinions to that effect, but there are also opinions that say, we're fine to have volunteers do volunteer work. I see. Yeah. I think we're fine. I think we should be fine to have them. Yeah, I remember when the old man got cut in grass. It was right. a personal mower. And, right. Yeah. <laughs> I think Mary and I um, were an active part of that 
on the painting issue. We yeah. Well, and I'm thinking back to a school I know that was mm. totally wired when we were first getting computers. That it, one school was all done by volunteers. They just got the approval from IT, and. So we're about halfway done with our list. Is this a good breaking point? Um, if, if the committee would like to adjourn, that's. We're going to spend two more hours, and I don't think we'll get productive when you get too, too late in the evening. Can I, can I make a, a comment? Sure. Alderman Dowd, at the very beginning, brought up the subject um, about the a vibrant downtown and the need to communicate to the city. I think that that's a, that's a core issue. And I'm one of the people that you have to convince. Like you, I moved here in 91, and I went down, I, I could move, I'd come back from Europe, and I could move anywhere in the country, anywhere I wanted to go. And I came to Nashua because it was listed in Money Magazine as the best place to live in America. And I went to the Chamber of Commerce, and I got all the literature, and I went outside, and I sat on Main Street on a bench, and I'm reading the literature, and I'm looking at Main Street, and I said, wow, this is the place for me. And I've been here ever since. And I used to write for the National Telegraph. I and I have a whole bunch of articles in my computer that I haven't sent in. One of them is titled, Why I Don't Use or Go Downtown. So I'm looking for reasons to go downtown and to be part of the downtown thing and make it a vibrant place and all that kind of stuff. And that that's the message that needs to get out there is, one, why is a vibrant downtown of so of a vital importance to somebody like me who lives outside uh, the main road and is not in the downtown area? Right. What's going to cause me to come downtown? I had dinner downtown last night right after our meeting. It was nice until ambulance, police car, ambulance, police car. You were there late. Pardon? You were there late. Oh, it's eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Yeah. But that, I think that's that's the that's the ingredient. That's part of the excitement of town. Well, <laughs> you know, my daughter is just breaking out. She's a nurse at, at, in the ER, and and she's looking to rent an apartment, and she's looking doing all these things. Well, maybe buying a condo, and she's looking in in Manchester, and she's looking everywhere because she can't find what she wants in a safe environment, and. I'm the one that's encouraging her to do so because I, I haven't been sold on it, you know. And communications, I'm going to go and sign up for the newsletter. I read the Telegraph day, every day, cover to cover, and I'm very critical of what I see in the Telegraph lately. And I let them know when, I, when I'm not happy about what I see there. Say, say more about the safe environment. Uh, or the perception of an unsafe environment, okay? I, I think the police department does a fantastic job. Uh, I'm locked in with, with Justin in emergency management, and I, I know all of the issues there. Um, I, I'm not sure what more the police department could do to make it any safer. I, 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 I can't ask for any more. So part but, of that is definitely perception. Absolutely. Because our violent crime rate is a third of Manchester's. Absolutely. And Manchester's and, is slightly higher than New York's, by the way. And, and, as the old man knows, you know, I, I talk to my neighbors a great deal, and we don't have a uh, a neighborhood watch or anything like right. that, but we talk. And the, uh, not too long ago, we were talking about how safe it is in our neighborhood. We don't see any police cars because they're not needed there, and it's a great thing because we know who's there and we take care of it, etc. Which is something that needs to be done everywhere. And I'm not saying it's not. I just, I'm just saying I, I know my neighborhood is safe. I go out at night, don't lock my doors. And I, don't, so don't usually, broadcast usually, that. <laughs> you see a fire truck and maybe two police cars, that's usually like a Narcan issue. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. You see multiple fire trucks and one police car and the house of fire. So, a different perception. But, and the reason they go slipping down Main Street is because we have one car at night in each sector. So, if somebody needs help, they got to get there quick. You know, a lot of times uh -oh. it passes I, quick, I, right through I Main don't. Street. I, you know, as I say, my daughter's in the ER, so I, I know I hear the story. But I'm, I'm, I'm reinforcing your opening statement mm -hmm. that, you know, it, 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 it's a great downtown. There's a lot of things to do down there. There's some fantastic restaurants. We just don't sell it. We just don't sell it. Well, and, and 
and you're you're right. There there is that people people don't realize it. I mean, we have a friend from Lexington who, whenever we get together, says, "I'll come up." And the first time he was here, he was like, "I can't believe what's on your main street," and. I actually like some of the restaurants in Lexington, but he always comes up here to go to dinner. <laughs> so we, we have a we have a fantastic marketing opportunity coming down the road in the form of the uh, holiday stroll, and we ought to maximize our selling opportunity at that time. Sell it to our own citizens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I I can say that great, I I think great time to showcase all the closed stores on Main Street because they're not open at the hours the stroll. Is. Yeah. Well, maybe. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. It's. Which, why don't we ask them to open? Why don't we ask them to be open? They have been. They okay. Yeah. Well, then. Oh, don't, she's the, working on that. Paul does it. The chamber does it. Yeah. Well, I understand. Yeah, they're, 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 they're their own shop owners. They choose their own hours. But, you know, here's an opportunity. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask. And. You know, I, you know, whether it's Paul Shea or whether it's the chamber, somebody should ask. Mm. Yeah. And if they don't ask, shame on them because we're trying to show, showcase the city and it's a beautiful event and there are, are thousands of thousands of people on the street and it, it would be nice to, right. to open up your doors and showcase um, your offerings and if, you know, if you don't Buy something that night, you might be enticed to come back another day. Right. 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 Learn well, the uniqueness of what's there. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, that one of the things they're doing in relationship to just that event is um, talking about even lighting some of the side streets so people get a sense that there is more than Main Street. Been talking that about we, that for years. Yeah, but they last year they started doing that, so looking at doing more of that, because that's one of the other things. We've we've got things off on side streets, but people aren't really well aware of that Another either. opportunity is the farmer's market. That, that's a tremendous opportunity yeah. there to, to showcase the downtown area. Right, right. And educate, educate the public. So, I mean, I'm kind of ashamed to admit it, but when I lived in Ward 5 and I worked in Manchester, I didn't know half of the things that were going on downtown. You know, now I'm here all the time. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, mm -hmm. but I didn't, for a long time, I didn't even know there was such, um, that GAD even existed. You know, and that there was this newsletter to sign up for that would um, send me events that were going on downtown. So, you know, when we're talking to people, we try to say, well, look at, you know, sign up for the GAD newsletter, or sign up, you know, um, and know about these events. Because if you're living on the outskirts, you know, in the ward, and you're not getting that information, you might not know. Um, you know, how many people know the grassroots music festival is mm -hmm. coming up? I bet if you took a poll, it might not be that many. Mm -hmm. So we have to communicate that. No, but we'll shut down Main Street for it when, it when it's here. And not many people are going to know about it. And then they're going to get upset that they can't traverse through the city because, or they'll be rerouted because of something that they don't know about. So we're all... We're all we oh, thought, worst enemy. We thought that. And then when we had the mayor's dance party, um, you know, I, we stood out, the, the policemen and I and DPW at the ends of the street, and we're just talking to people. There were relatively no complaints about it being shut down. Um, and people, you know, yes, maybe the... I don't know how many people came. It looked like a lot. The people that came had a great time, even though it started to rain. They still stayed and danced. Um, but there were hardly any complaints of you know that you heard, um, and we certainly didn't hear of any by email um, about closing the road. So sometimes I think some of that is perception of people getting 
upset. And if you can get the communication out there earlier enough, you, I mean, you can shut down areas of Main Street without impacting traffic flow. There's ways around around the downtown. Close Elm Street in Manchester for road races. Yeah, they it's a lot Elm longer street. street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they close it a lot. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So, what is the desire? Do we want to um, adjourn? And I will have Sue. Sue has been great at trying to coordinate, coordinate all of the meeting schedules and come up with a day that works for across committees and boards and everything else going on. So I'll make a motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Adjourned at 9.08.